Hello, BookTube, and welcome to your Wednesday comics installment. This is when we we talk about comic books. I talk about comics twice a week on this channel. Wednesday is, of course, traditionally for a long time now the new release day for comics, for new issues. And that is not as, as empty an occasion as it has been for a few months because the comic shops here in Boston are back open. And one of them, the one that I typically go to, is offering, at least saying on its website, that that the staff is being very careful, that common spaces, handrails and countertops and whatnot are being disinfected regularly, and that masks are being handed out of the door, and that customers are free to browse as they like. So uh, Massachusetts pandemic numbers have gone way, way down. It's highly unlikely that you would, that you would, by this point, it's highly unlikely that you have the, the virus and are shedding it without knowing it if you've been stuck in your house for four months. And it's incredibly unlikely that you're contracting it given these measures are in place. So I could do that. I could go to the comic shop today and get new issues, uh, except for two things. <laughs> Number one is that my comic shop, I am uh, 28 years old, and that means I am a creature of habits. Uh, I work hard against that because that will calcify your brain, and there's no worse fate, right? I think we can all agree on that, that as age creeps up on you, Yes, achy knuckles, or a leaky a leaky bladder, or uh, wakefulness at night, or weakness in the muscles. All of those things are part of the headaches of getting older, as the old phrase goes. It's not for sissies. Getting old is not for sissies. Uh, but they're nothing compared to losing your mind. I think we can all agree on that, right? And one of the ways that, that helps you to lose your mind is to let it calcify, to let it grow over with plaque, to let it stiffen. So routines, uh, thinking as I'm sure a lot of old people that you know think, thinking that you already know everything you're ever going to know, and maybe you've known that for a long time. This is why I find people my own age so insufferable on a general, as a general rule, because they've stopped. They've stopped learning or growing. They're not adaptable in any way. Can't talk to them. You can only listen while they reaffirm what they've said 50,000 times before. That gets boring. <laughs> it gets very boring. I'm, I take it as the highest possible compliment. When my muscular young people, who I, I haven't had access to because they're, they're either stuck in their homes playing Animal Crossing all day long or they're, they've gone off to the various cities and states where they live and the school is not reconvening, college is not reconvening. But when we were hanging out every week, I took it as the highest possible compliment that they would often say that they completely forgot how old I was, <laughs> that I don't strike them as anything like their parents or their grandparents made it easier, I should point out, not, not to harp on this to you parents out there and you grandparents out there, but that fact made it much easier for them to both solicit my opinion about things that were genuinely confusing them that I guarantee their parents have never heard from them, but also to take my advice. It made it easier for them to take my advice because I wasn't handing it down for them from Mount Sinai. That makes a big difference. <laughs> I don't. I'm not. I'm not trying to worry you all. But if you are, if you are the parent of a teenage boy, there, there is probably, um, how to put this. If you are the parent of a teenage boy, then and and you are slightly stiffened in your way, slightly calcified in your attitudes, your opinions, your approaches to things, your ability to learn, your willingness to take on new things. If you are that parent then I think it's safe to assume that you only know about 25 to 30 percent of what makes up that teenage son of yours. 25 to 30 percent. So, so 70 percent of that boy is unknown to you. And it wouldn't be. <laughs> I'm not mean to harp on this. It wouldn't be uh, if you changed ways. <laughs> it's, not the, it's not the boy's fault. It's your fault. <laughs> but... but uh, even so, that having been said, I hate to admit it, but my comic shop here in Boston is on a root of mine. I make roots. It's not so much that I'm that I'm stiffened in my ways, it's that I don't particularly like... Uh, I have a lot of work to do. I have a lot of writing to do, and I am blessed to be able to do that on my couch with my dog in complete peace and comfort with... with breezes heavy with lilac smells coming through the window right next to my head. I, I, I am reluctant to leave that scenario. It's, 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 not, it's not that I'm, uh, you know, lazy or, or close-minded. It's that 
I worked for a long time to get to a point where that would be my day and it would pay. And now that I'm there, it would be the, the height of hypocrisy to have that and think, well, I'm just sitting around all day. <laughs> so it, I had a route, a routine, three or four days a week that involved a number of different places. And that's what, what, what its appeal was, was that I could consolidate all of those things and enjoy them and get them out of the way and have fun with them all in one route. And the comic shop that I go to was part of that route. And none of the other parts of that route are still in operation. They haven't come back yet, the other parts of that route. So going to my local comic shop would involve just going there, talking to the staff, getting comics, then turning around and coming all the way back. And that, I try not to do that. I try to maximize, maybe you're like this, I try to maximize the things I'm doing in any outing instead of isolated things like that. That's one of the reasons why I don't have new issues to show you today. And the other reason is that I, in the last few years, I've fallen into the habit of checking online. There are various online sites that will tell you what's coming out, what new issues are out on the stands the next day. And I checked for today, and oh my god. <laughs> First of all, there's a whole bunch of ongoing series that I don't follow, and that I certainly haven't followed in months where they haven't been in newsstands or where the comic shops have been closed by government order. So there's no chance there, none whatsoever. The only one ongoing series that I am following in the floppy individual issues is DC's new reboot of the Legion of Superheroes, and only because Mark Richardson and his wife have been kind enough to send me the issues that I've been missing, because Vermont had it easier. Although I look at the, uh, the national trends for the pandemic, I see that Vermont's numbers are shooting up. So it, it could be that no state in the union is going to have it easy forever. And that would make sense because everybody travels all the time now. But uh, they were sending me, they've been nice enough to send me issues of the Legion of Superheroes. So I'm all set there. But I looked at the list of other ongoing issues. I don't know any of them. I don't, I wouldn't know what was going on. Even if I liked the artist, I wouldn't know what was going on. Which left my old standby. Trade paperback collections and hardcover collections. And there was one due out today that caught my eye. The latest hardcover reprint volume of The Avengers, of Marvel's The Avengers. Marvel is doing epic collections that are, I wonder if I have one here. Uh, no, not at hand. No, not easily. Uh, oh no, yes. Uh, this. Marvel is doing epic collections. This is one for Conan. Uh, the soft cover, full, full color reprint things uh, that bounce all around in the chronology of uh, any given title. But Marvel is also doing uh, Marvel Masterworks. Do I have one of those? Do I? Do I have one of those? Yes, Marvel is also doing Marvel Masterworks that they number and that are sequential. So, so uh, for instance, the Marvel Masterworks Thor, this is volume 11, followed by volume 12. They're just going to reprint everything from Thor all just in a row, just in sequence. And Marvel's doing that for the Avengers, and the latest Marvel event, the latest Avengers Marvel Masterworks volume is out today. I forget the number of it, but oh my God, I remember the issues. <laughs> the issues in this are some of the worst Avengers issues ever made. We've talked, excuse me, in these comic book videos about how there are runs, there are arcs in various superhero comic book titles. An artist or a writer will be on a run. They'll have a great storyline. Fans will love it. Uh, they'll be inspired. And then maybe that creative team will leave. A new creative team will come on board and maybe they know what they're doing and maybe they don't. Maybe they need a little time to find their footing. Maybe they never do. And that is true for the Avengers. It's true for every Marvel comic. And uh, the, this run, <laughs> this latest Marvel Masterworks volume of the Avengers is one of the trough periods. It's just awful. Just awful awful. They're reprinting in this volume, they're shoehorning in uh, an Avengers annual that we've already seen in a comic book Wednesday on this channel that was drawn by Michael Golden and is just fantastic. Just amazing artwork. Beautiful. Like it, like you almost never see in comics these days. But that is literally the only thing that is worth any kind of attention in this volume and it's a hundred dollars. All the rest of it is horrible artwork even by the great Gene Cohen who was called on for a while to do some issues of the Avengers, even though it's the last book in the world that a writer, an artist of his style, should do. He has a very brooding, very atmospheric style. The only reason that, he, that they called him on, I feel certain, is two reasons. One, 
He's an old style workhorse. If he tells you that he'll have pages ready on a certain date, he will. There's no, no, no you don't have to worry about it. And two, he does have a brief history with the Avengers from decades before, but this work, no, 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 no. This was just awful. These issues are just awful. Nothing salvageable in any of them. So it's a volume that I would have missed anyway. So I didn't go to the comic shop for those two reasons, because it's still not on a workable route. And because this is the, that's the only thing I would have been remotely interested in buying, I will probably buy the next one. I know what's coming in the next volume, and the one before it was really good, but this is a trough between great arcs. So there was no reason for me to get new issues. So I have old issues to show you. And I'm working my way through one of my cardboard long boxes. I don't have many of them. I don't have a thousand like, like uh, Marvel freakazoids do, where everything's carefully bagged and boarded, and, and it's in careful chronological order, and it is never read. It's never touched. It's, I've been in, in, in uh, apartments of undergraduate apartments of people who had long box collections like that, who wouldn't, they got upset if you even rested a plate of food on top of the box. Just, just they just become the, the Ark of the Covenant. You're not supposed to touch it or even look at it. Horrible fate for comics that are meant to be looked at. But as you know from watching these comic book videos of mine, that is not how I treat my comics. I have, I have read the daylights out of these things, and I continue to do so. I go back all the time and reread back issues, even though I am steadily eliminating the need to do that by getting epic collections, hardcover collections, omnibus collections of everything that I want. Sooner or later, I will get everything that I want. That would be great. That'd be absolutely great. One of you is doing me the enormous favor, bigger than you can guess, of sending me electronic copies of Superboy. Not the clone Superboy, but Clark Kent when he was a boy. From the late 1940s and the mid and into the 1950s. The original run of Superboy. And I cannot thank that person enough <laughs> for a whole bunch of reasons. Those issues are a gospel to me. They are absolute gospel to me for a number of reasons. It's been great. Uh, but I, that's electronically. I've been looking through my, in my individual paper issues. And working my way through that, the current long box that I'm on, I noticed that the next handful that I was pulling out were a different shape and size. <laughs> These are not normal superhero comics. This is Savage Sword of Conan. A larger magazine style. Uh, that Marvel did in the 1970s, started in the 1970s. Uh, here we have, let's see here, this is number 11. Uh, let's see, I'll, take you, I'll just take you through here. Look at that, Earl Norum. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> uh, the slithering shadow. <laughs> How awesome. <laughs> uh, it's the pool of the black one. I think that's only part one. Uh, the Tower of the Elephant. Look at that. This was this is uh, a cover by Earl Norum with artwork by John Duskema. And he's inked by uh, uh, a great inker, Alfredo Alcala, who never did... As far as I know, Alcala never inked John Duskema when he was drawing just ordinary Marvel comics. But his inking of... Uh, of Duskema in black and white is an artistic experience you have to see to believe. It's just, just incredible. Look at that. I guarantee you, that tavern scene is not the way Buscema drew it. Except in its rudiments. Oh. You're not supposed to make an appearance in comic book videos. Right? We went over this. <laughs> I promised. Uh, and these are just amazing. Look at the detail in these. It better better than any other inker. I wish that Alcala had inked Buscema for his entire run on Savage Sword of Conan, but of course, this went on for decades, <laughs> and, and that is not possible. There's Death Beyond the Black River, uh, which I believe is the cover of a, a collected volume. There's another... Or no, this is Bob Larkin. Wow, it's considerably better than... That's a Beast of Jebel Sag. Huh? This is a, a slightly bad cover. This is uh, Nesta Redondo. Uh, where Conan becomes king. Uh, don't want to be looking up Conan's skirt. I know what you meant. You wanted it to be dramatic, but we don't want to be doing that. Here's another uh, Earl Norm. He can't do a bad cover. What I wouldn't give for a big, uh, lovingly restored edition of just 
Earl Norm's artwork, just in general, his comic book covers, just in general, are amazing. There's one. Conan is drinking at a water at a water pool, and we can see reflected in the water the creature that is facing him. <laughs> uh, here's a really bad cover. I don't know who did this. This is uh, after Marvel took over. Mar Marvel. There was a, a publishing house, Curtis, Curtis Publishing House, that did Savage Sword of Conan. Uh, for a long time, and then uh, and and then Marvel took it over, and it, it was sort of bad. It's still Roy Thomas drawing it. It's still John Buscema, uh, Roy Thomas writing it, John Buscema drawing it. But Savage Sword of Conan decreases in in quality, as far as I'm concerned. But these early issues are amazing, just amazing, and not only for the great Conan uh, material, but also for all of the ins the incidental stuff. Let me see if I can, I can show you what I mean here. Uh, all the incidental stuff you yeah you get Roy Thomas just writing prose like crazy every aspect of this thing because this was a new venture that Marvel did Marvel had already had uh, I wonder if I can find another example Marvel had already had a number of these newsstand magazine type things that uh, yeah look at that this is just a whole bunch of prose stuff with incidental artwork that is nowhere else. Uh, Marvel had already had a run of these things, uh, Dracula, I think, and Zombie, and horror, horror magazines, that were printed in a larger size, they were tended to be black and white, and because they were magazines classified as such and sent to newsstands as such, they didn't have, you can see it's not anywhere on the cover here, they didn't have to pay any attention to the Comics Code Authority, uh, which, which wanted to guarantee in mainstream superhero comics a kind of family wholesomeness that is kind of antithetical to the stories of Conan. And when Roy Thomas and Stan Lee thought up this idea, first Savage Tales and then it became Savage Sword of Conan, it, it was a, it's a perfect fit. It's hand in glove with Conan because now if Conan wants to chop somebody's arm off, you can see it. Biscayma can just draw it. If if uh, in the, the Slithering Shadow, when Conan fights a creature from the pit, he's covered in its venom. And it causes his body, to, his face, to swell up horribly. And you couldn't do that in a, in a comics code comic book. But you can in a, in a magazine of the Savage Sword of Conan to say nothing of the sexual innuendos that are a prime aspect of Roy Thomas's realization of this character and that have to be toned down in the monthly color comic. But in the Savage Sword of Conan, no. <laughs> no, you don't have to do that. And it's wonderful. The result is wonderful, thoroughly, thoroughly different in tone from the Conan the Barbarian color comic book that Marvel was putting out at the same time. And uh, not immediately as successful as the horror issues. In the editorials, those editorial information that Roy Thomas was drawing, uh, was writing for a lot of these issues, uh, he was bemoaning often the fact that this, this, this thing was not paying, that it was a, in powerless footing, that it might be ending, that this issue might be the last, next issue might be the last. But in between that belly aching, he and Stan Lee managed to put out some fantastic issues. Just fantastic. It was Savage Sword of Conan back in the 70s that led me to a heretical opinion of mine that hasn't really ever changed. <laughs> I haven't, I've hesitated to bring it up on BookTube because it'll cause howls of protest, probably someplace on the west coast of Ireland, probably someplace in a small town Vermont, but I call them like I see them, and that heretical opinion is that Roy Thomas is a much better writer of Conan the Barbarian than Robert E. Howard was. <laughs> I think it's true. Now, part of that is unfair because Robert E. Howard had only a very little, little amount of time writing Conan before he killed himself. But part of it is not. Part of it is it, a wonderful realization of the character. I, I think it's uh, Conan, Roy Thomas's Conan is at least as interesting and enjoyable for me to read as Robert E. Howard's Conan, and puts in sh into shadow, just puts to shame, the Conan of the pastiche novels by Andrew Offit or uh, Steve Perry or Robert Jordan. Those, those are worthy, or, or even Elsbrug de Camp. Those are worthy in their own way, and I like them. I have a whole bunch of them. But when it comes to somebody who gets Conan, I think Roy Thomas really, really does. I think he gets Conan to an extent that might even exceed Conan's own creator. Uh, but one way or another, whether you agree with that heretical opinion or not, these issues are great, and I love them. I wish I had a whole bunch of them, and in a way, I do. Because in 2018, Marvel Comics got the rights back to Conan the Barbarian, 
and Savage Sword of Conan and started bringing out, you saw it on this channel, they started bringing out monthly comics of both. Uh, that could be good, could, they, they I think uh, Savage Sword of Conan especially quickly went downhill. Uh, but the, the original, I don't know, year of both those comics were, were, could be very good, could be very entertaining, had lots and lots of stuff in them. Uh, and the, even before those comics came out and I thought that they that were pretty good, I was still happy that Marvel got the rights back because I knew that it gave Marvel permission to reprint, to reprint the daylights out of the, their original run of Conan the Barbarian and Savage Sword of Conan. And the industry has caught up with that decision in the meantime. When Marvel was originally doing Conan and Savage Sword of Conan, there was no reprint culture in the, Mar in the comic book world. It was, it was assumed that there would be no money in reprinting something for adults to be put on a shelf in a bookstore. These were just comic books. They were dispensable. Uh, that has changed. And I knew that, that going in, Marvel would see that and that they'd see that that's where a lot of their money was because adult collectors will spend for those things. So they started coming out with these. Marvel Omnibus collections of both Conan the Barbarian and Savage Sword of Conan. This is in volume number one of the Savage Sword of Conan, and it's the only one I currently have. I am sure that I could get volume two for very little money online, $50 maybe. And I should. I should. By my count, the first four of these Omnibus volumes will be of interest to me. The first four of these will cover all the great stuff that Savage Sword of Conan did, and oh my god, was some of it great. It wasn't just John Buscema, inked by Alfredo Alcala, although that combination occurs regularly in the early issues of Savage Sword of Conan and is incredible. It isn't just that, it's also all sorts of other artists. You have Jim Starlin uh, doing, doing some fantastic work before any of his other famous Marvel work. You have, of course, famously Barry Windsor Smith, who at the time was a dreamy 20-something who just called himself Barry Smith, but who did his style broke out. He did Conan, the Barbarian, but his style broke out on Savage Sword of Conan and became. he started to explore what kind of an artist he himself wanted to be, and it's amazing work, including uh, Marvel's first drawing of The Tower of the Elephant, a great Conan short story. Uh, and, uh, and also, uh, you have some great pairings, like the great artist Gil Kane, who's one of my favorite comic book artists, inked by Neil Adams. <laughs> Where are you going to find a combination like that? Uh, and also, these omnibus volumes that Marvel puts out, uh, in addition to, these are all of the issues. So there's only one overlap. Just this issue overlaps with the, with the individual issues that I have here. But these, these uh, volumes, I think I've talked about this with uh, other Marvel omnibus volumes, they have everything. They reprint everything from these original issues. So you have all of the prose stuff all of the incidental artwork from other artists and all of the uh you have all of the in-house ads all of the covers in full color you have the back has annotated pages clean cover artwork and also another i think uh, another uh yeah multiple pages of in-house ads so you just you have every single thing possible including the letters the letters that were sent to Savage Sword of Conan are reprinted here at the end of every issue, just like they were. You have to go back to these individual issues to get that. Other, in, in most reprint volumes, you're not going to get the letters. And the letters are here, and they are from everybody. Joe Duffy. Uh, Ralph Macchio, who went on to become an executive editor poobah at Marvel Comics, but who was writing letters at the time. He wasn't an editor then. You have letters from uh, uh, Fritz Leiber. Um... Uh, Harlan Ellison, all, all sorts of, of uh, all, and the letters are great fun to read. Just people coming across Savage Sword of Conan and realizing that it was the best visual realization of these stories they love that they've ever encountered. Even better than the visual realizations that Marvel was doing in their monthly Conan comic book, the color comic book, Conan the Barbarian. I love reading them. I, and, and also, I don't know if you can tell, but uh, extra care was put into... Uh, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Extra care was put into the incidental details. That is between every chapter. Uh, the, the naked hardcover of this has beautiful, beautiful artwork on it. That care was put into these things. As if somebody, can, in connection with this omnibus reprint line, knew that these are treasures. That these, these origin, This original run of Savage Sword of Conan is amazing. 
And that's why I'm a little bit confused that I don't have any other of these. I should have the first omnibus of Conan of the Conan the Barbarian in Marvel, and also the second omnibus of Savage Sword of Conan, at least, if I don't have the two others that follow that. I should, and those things are probably fairly marked down online if I look around. So this will be a reminder to me, these this comic book video, it'll be a reminder to me to go and do that, because these are these are ones that I want. I go back to this Conan hardcover all the time. Uh, so that's your Conan for that's your your comic book for today. It's not really comic books. These are magazines. These are officially magazines. They uh, look at that Tower of the Elephant. Oh my! Uh, it's even though you, you wouldn't really backhand a spider like that. You're not going to present the spider with the whole of your body as a free poke before you get to it. But that's okay. It was dramatic. That's all. Uh, I. Now that I have these out, you know that I'm just going to pour through all of them. But but uh, that is your comic book video for today. And I'm, I'm assuming I don't have as many of these as I... Once upon a time I had a pile of these Savage Sword of Conans, and I don't anymore. I don't know where they went. Uh, but once I get through uh, lovingly paging through all of these older issues, I will then move on. Probably on Friday we will have color comics to talk about again. So I will wrap this up for now, and I will see you then. Thank you, Book 2.